some, some play going on at the school, and uh, it's like um, they told, like, the top part and the middle part and the bottom part, it was like, all right, three different groups, we want you to paint. And it was like, all right, so this lake doesn't match this lake. The top of that tree is a little off, and uh, the castle's okay, but... So it'll be a great, actually a great backdrop for the live stream today, me in a castle, a kingdom. <laughs> all right, king, all right, eh, whatever. Good morning, welcome. We didn't do a good morning welcome this morning, um, which is okay, but good morning and welcome. So glad to have you guys all here. Um, my voice is a little shot. You probably can tell there's a little bit of something going on. Our Household had a bit of a sickness go through it this week, and our youngest had strep throat, but is good now. She's on the heavy meds, and I went and tested negative for that, but something was rolling through me, and so I'm, I'm beyond it, but still the residual, you know, that annoying, like, stuff. So that's why I sound a little congested, but that's okay, because I can still preach, I think. Um, so let's get into uh, Mark chapter 2, and listen, we're going to jump right in. We... Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time at the end with a little bit of um, like theology lesson kind of history. It's going to be fun. Um, but before we do that, we're going to get into our third controversy. Um, so we're in the book of Mark and we're in chapter two. And what we've been seeing the last few weeks is these controversies that start to arise between Jesus and the religious leaders. And the whole point of, of breaking it down to these five different controversies is just to kind of create some of that tension that we feel in the book of Mark and um, trying to give it kind of a bigger picture narrative feel. And so um, as we move, this is kind of the, the point of the story where that tension starts to build. And we'll see here pretty soon these religious leaders are like, all right, we've had enough, and they start to plan and conspire against Jesus. And a lot of what we're seeing these last few weeks and the next couple weeks as well is all what leads into this. So we've got these controversies. What is Jesus saying and what is he doing that's, that's causing such a stir and it's causing such a, such a barrier to be created between him and the religious leaders? So the one we're, we're going to see today, the controversy, number three, is that Jesus' disciples did not fast. Now, this is a big controversy, and we'll see why, but this is, this is it, right? His disciples were not fasting, and that created a massive problem for the religious leaders. Let's get into Mark chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 18 through 22, and um, we'll read that in its entirety, and we'll look at what this controversy is all about. So, Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. So here's our big idea, all right? And we don't see it very clearly quite yet, but here it is underlined. Jesus came to usher in a new covenant by his blood. Jesus came to usher in a new covenant by his blood. Now, you might go, how did you get that from what we just read? Because you just told me some, some word stories, like some pictures of, you know, wine and clothes and a bridegroom at a wedding. Like, how does that, what does that have to do with the new covenant of his blood? And we'll get into that in just a little bit. But it's interesting here that we see that John the Baptist, his disciples are included in those opening verses, right? It says that John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. So you, you have to understand, we have to understand this morning that we're, Jesus is in a time right now when, when the religious leaders, um, the, the law, the Old Testament law, like all of these things that they were holding tightly to, it was not just for the, the Pharisees or the scribes or the Sadducees or those people in leadership. Like everybody who was religious at this time, this is what they were following. 
So John's disciples, John the Baptist himself, probably was holding to these fasts. Like this was just kind of, it became the norm. It became the tradition. It became kind of the rites and the rituals of the religious system. So we see them included, right? Because John, he would, have, he would have stressed the importance of fasting. John is what some um, would consider one of the last Old Testament prophets. Even though we had that, you know, that, that time in between the Testaments, like he was a prophet. He was coming to talk about what was to come, right? So he wasn't in the Old Testament, but some would call him, you know, he was coming out of that Old Testament time and prophesying about what was to come. So he was holding, holding to these fasts as well. But whatever the case might be, it seems that this passage happened on a day of fasting. Now, we don't know exactly if it happened immediately after the feast that we saw in the previous passage where Jesus is eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. Um, maybe the party's still happening, and so they're coming to them and saying, why aren't you fasting? You're having a feast. You're sharing a meal together. But what seems very clear is that while the Pharisees are presently fasting, Jesus and his disciples are not. Right? There's the issue. There's a day of fasting and Jesus and his disciples are not following the fast. So remember that the Pharisees, they, they weren't just following the Old Testament law, but what they were doing is they were adding certain rituals to it. So this idea of fasting is a requirement out of the law for one occasion and one occasion only, and that was on the Day of Atonement, which is found in Leviticus 16 and 23. In fact, even today on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, um, they still hold a fast. The, the Jewish people still hold a fast. So that is still a day of fasting for the Jewish people. And that's in the, in the, in the Old Testament law. That was the day that was, that was required. However, the Pharisees had added to this by requiring a fast every Monday and Thursday. So twice a week, on Mondays and Thursdays, it was re required in this religious system that you are to fast on those days. So they had added to the law. And this is where some of the issues that we're going to see here in the, in the difference in the old and the new start to arise. So, on top of that, adding to the religious system, when, when Jesus eventually teaches on fasting, it's not just that they added to it, but what does he say about how they fast, right? They, they make a public display of their fasting, right? He says, don't be like the Pharisees when they fast because they walk around just looking gloomy and sad and like, woe is me because I'm so hungry but I'm so righteous. And they walk around just, just they, they want it to be visible. They want people to see that they're fasting, to see their righteousness because they're following the law. They walk around and it's like, look at the sacrifice that I'm making, right? So it's not just adding to it, but it's, a, it's become now about the public display of righteousness rather than actually just wanting to follow the law to honor God because that's the law that he gave. And that's just one of the many that the Pharisees had added to and therefore had distorted. But here we go again, right? This Jesus character shows up and he starts to live in defiance of our religion, like, this is what we do, this is what we follow, and here's this man who is starting to, to do the opposite, right? He's claimed to be God, he's eating with sinners, and now he's disregarding the ritual of fasting. So the tension, right? And in answering the question posed to him, here's what he does. He uses three illustrations to paint the picture of what is taking place. And all three carry a similar message, but each one is a bit unique, and we'll see that as we go through them. So the first illustration is that there is no time for mourning. This is the first illustration about the wedding and the, and the celebration that ensues after. Verses 19 and 20. Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. So we have to take into account a parallel passage here from the Gospel of Matthew. Because in his retelling of the story, he substitutes the word mourn for fast. There's no time to mourn when the bridegroom is still here. And this is an important um, distinction to make because he, what Matthew is doing is he's associating the kind of fasting that the Pharisees are talking about with mourning. Right? I'm fasting because I am in mourning. And this really helps with the illustration that Jesus uses. And, and it's going to also provide helpful, I think, to understand the custom of that day, um, that after the wedding, there was a week-long marriage feast. So it wasn't just ceremony and everyone goes home, but it was ceremony and then we party for a whole entire week. 
Also, the bride, word bridegroom has multiple meanings, but here in our context, he's referring to the groom, all right? So let's take all of that together. We have a week-long party in which the bride and groom would, would have been there and have been celebrating with them. So why would they mourn, right? If, if we're going to celebrate this wedding and we're going to celebrate it together, then why would we mourn when the bride and groom are still present? Wouldn't we want it to be a time of celebration, right? A time of, of spending time together, now, we have, we have family um, quite literally all over the world. We have, um, our girls have cousins in Kentucky, in Virginia, in Florida, and in Lebanon um, across the globe. And recently, when we have the opportunity to visit family or when family visits us, our girls have been showing a lot of emotion when the day for departure is coming. Whether it's us coming home or family leaving, it could be like the day before, a couple days before, and all of a sudden you're in bed and there's tears flowing. And they're like, oh, but I don't want them to leave. And I don't, you know, but, and, and all, every time we're like, yeah, but you still have like a whole day to play tomorrow. Like they're still here for, for a whole day. So let's not, let's not cry about it. Like let's, let's, you know, have fun and let's enjoy the time that we still have together. Right, but there's this like emotional, like why are you crying? This is not a time to mourn, like they're still here. You're gonna have time to, to, to be with them tomorrow and to hang out and to play and all of that. And then when they leave, okay, like let's, let's mourn that departure, right? But like now is not the time for that because they're still here or we're still here for another day. You get, a, you get a jump in the pool again tomorrow, right? But Jesus says, a day is coming. Right? A day is coming when the bridegroom is taken away and then it will be time to mourn. Now, Jesus is referring here to his arrest and his crucifixion. So, while Jesus is present, it's a cause for celebration. But he's going to be taken away very suddenly, and then they will be left in despair, at least for a couple of days. But Jesus is speaking here of fasting, right? The next two illustrations will open the conversation to a much broader change, and this is really where we're going to spend the chunk of our morning. So he's saying, hey, it's, it's fasting, right? And, and I know you ask us about fasting, but let me just give you a hint as to what's really coming, because it goes much deeper than and, and, and much beyond just fasting, right? So the second illustration that he uses, um, we're going to call it don't fix the old with the new, but the second illustration is about the garment, right? About patching new uh, cloth on an old garment. Now, I didn't know this because, um, well, I didn't even know this word. There's a lot I didn't know this week. I'm not a seamster, okay? I, I put seamstress and I was like, is there a male version of a seamstress? There is. It's a seamster, okay? I'm not one of them. Um, but repairing, here, here's the thing. Repairing an old garment with an unshrunk piece of fabric was a huge no-no. And I don't know if, it, like, if people still patch things up today like that um, or if you have to worry about, the, I, I don't know. I'm not one. But Here's why you wouldn't put something new on something old. One, it doesn't match, right? Like you put a new piece of cloth and the old one is worn and the color has faded. And so if you put a new one on, it's just not going to really go well. Although today that is kind of the look. Like I put a, you know, a dark blue patch on my light blue jeans. And it's like, that's cool. Um, but like then you wouldn't put the, the, the same color together because one's worn and one looks new. But what Jesus says even, even more importantly is that if you put a, a new patch on an old piece of cloth, what's going to happen when you wash it is that new one is going to shrink and it's going to pull that old one with it and it's going to make tears all around where you, where you sewed it in. So it's going to shrink and it's going to pull and it's going to tear and it's going to ruin that old, that old garment, right? So that's what he's talking about. You can't put the new one on the old one. If you, if you haven't shrunk the new one yet, it's not going to work. It's going to tear and make the whole worse. Here's his point, right? The legalistic Judaism of that time had gotten pretty bad. Now, I, I would encourage you, um, you know, if you have some time, read Matthew chapter 23 to follow up because it, tells, it talks a lot more of what the Pharisees were doing. Um, there's a lot of, you know, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you Pharisees. He's calling out the religious leaders in that chapter for leading people astray, and he gets very specific. But remember that, that Jesus said it himself, right? He didn't come... He didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. He didn't come to do, to, to, to do away with it completely, but he came to fulfill them is what he says. And it's important to make that distinction here, right? The law was, the law was in, in and of itself, it was good and it was necessary. It wasn't sufficient completely, 
But Paul even calls it righteous and good. Right? This is righteous. This is, this is good. But the Jewish leaders had added so much to it that it became more about keeping the man-made customs right, fast on Monday and Thursday, than it did about just honoring the Lord in obedience. Like, I want to follow this because this is what the Lord has called us to do. But Jesus had arrived and there was now a new way. So the old covenant, right, the old agreement between God and man, the old garment was to be replaced with the new covenant between God and man, the, the new patch. And that covenant was marked by the blood of Jesus. And we'll talk more about that shortly. But what Jesus is getting at is it's not just fasting, but we have this old covenant, this old agreement, the old way of doing things. And now we have the new covenant, the new agreement, a new way of doing things. And those are not they're not combatable. Or com, what was the word? Compat. I have one letter off. Combatible. I guess they are combatible. They can, but they're not compatible. Okay. That's crazy. All right. One commentator follows this, this idea up by saying that the true gospel cannot be successfully attached to the tattered garment of superficial religion worn so proudly by the scribes and Pharisees. So you cannot add the, the new to the old. And again, his statements are so much deeper than just fasting. But what he's telling the religious leaders and those who are listening is that everything is about to change. Everything is about to change. Their way of, of doing religion was coming to an end because he had come, therefore finality had come. And we'll talk again about that in just a few moments. Now the third illustration is much like the second, so we won't, won't spend much time on it. Um, the, the new wine and the new wine skin, um, just a new word picture for saying the same thing. Uh, typically in that time, um, wine skins were made of goat skin and the rough part would have been on the inside and the new wine would actually ferment and it would crack the dried up old skins. And so that's why he says you don't put new wine into an old wine skin because when that new wine settles and ferments, it's going to crack that old skin. And not only would the container crack and burst, but the new wine would also be ruined along with the old wineskin. So not only is it damaging to the old, but now you're throwing out the new and the old. So again, he's just saying these two do not go together. You can't add them to each other, right? And, and we see all throughout letters, right? Like you, it's, it's not Jesus and, right? It's Jesus only. You can't add them to each other. Here's what I want to do now. I want to, because um, it's a good word picture but what does it mean for us? Like, what is the implication of what Jesus is saying to them and then for us as well? So we're going to do, we're going to take a little, a little journey together, and we're going to just kind of look at Old Covenant versus New Covenant. So you can throw that up there. Uh, I think that's next, Lisa, all right? Old Covenant, New Covenant. There you go. Boom. All right. So we're going we're gonna, to um, we're gonna talk about this. But let's think first again. Let's try to put ourselves in the shoes of these Jewish religious leaders. Because here's this man, right? He just kind of comes bursting onto the scene and he's trying to say that everything that we've been teaching, everything that we've been holding on to, the religious law that the Lord gave Moses on Mount Sinai that has become what every aspect of our lives revolves around, he's telling us that he's come with something that's going to replace it. So, so just sometimes, you know, we, yes, they should get a bad rap because they weren't righteous, but they were, you know, they were, they were hypocrites. But at the same time, you've got to understand that, like, everything that they had been holding so tightly to, everything that their lives had been about was just completely getting taken out from under them. So, so their, their confusion and anger and, and unrest, like, you kind of look and go, yeah, it kind of makes sense why they were a little bit distraught when everything that they knew to be true about their religious system was getting taken away. Right? Now, they had added and all that so we can get there. But, but you, you've got to imagine, like... This is a pretty big deal for these people. I mean, how hard would it have been to just let go of that, right? Okay, Jesus, fine. I, I'm going to let go of all of it. Like, how hard would that, that, that would have been so difficult, right? It could very easily feel like their whole, their whole world is just falling apart. And, and so we'll see that instead of allowing that, the freedom to let it go, they tighten their grip. And this is what causes the, um, you know, all, all the conflict eventually that we'll see between them and Jesus. But let's take a little journey through biblical history for just a few minutes, okay? There's, um, there's no way we can really get to the, to the depth of the difference here, but I'm going to try my best to lead us um, in, a, in a, you know, at least some understanding of it. So hopefully this is going to be helpful. So Jesus makes it very clear that the old and the new are not 
compatible, right? They can't be combined. You can't add one to the other. One has to be brought to completion for the other to take effect. So one has to be, okay, it's done, it's ended, and now the new one has come. And we're speaking again of the old and new covenant, the agreement between God and man. That's what the covenant is. It's an agreement between God and man. Now, there are two kinds of covenants. All right, this might be a little more than you guys asked for this morning, but that's okay. I think it's important to note some of these things. Two kinds of covenants. One is called unconditional and one is called conditional. So the Abrahamic covenant, which was um, one of the first made um, between God and man, it was considered unconditional. What that means is that there were no conditions by which man had to live by. God made a promise, and no matter what man did, he was going to live by that promise. You can find it in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, but this from a biblical commentator. When a covenant was dependent upon both parties keeping commitments, then both parties would have passed between the pieces of animal. If you remember the, the covenant between God and Abraham, Abraham uh, was put to sleep and God walked through. But in Genesis 15, God is the only one that goes through, right? So this is an unconditional, like this is, this is God walking through and making a promise. Abraham did not walk through. So God binds himself to the covenant. Now, later, God gave Abraham the right of circumcision as the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, and all males in Abraham's line were to be circumcised and thus carry with them life, the lifelong mark in their flesh that they were part of God's physical blessing in the world. So there was one thing, right? You, just, you have to circumcise all the men, and, and any descendant of Abraham who refused circumcision was declaring himself outside of the covenant. So God made a promise and if you want to stay in the covenant, then you are circumcised and you circumcise your kids. In that covenant, God promises land. He promises offspring. He promises protection. He promises blessing. He promises redemption. He promised that it's going to be an eternal promise. He reaffirms that covenant with Isaac and Jacob, but this was not dependent on the actions of man. This was an unconditional, God made a promise, and he's going to hold it no matter what man does. That's unconditional. Then, and this is the really important one this morning for us, you have the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant is the one that the Jewish leaders would have held on to so, so tightly. This was a conditional promise. Both sides had to hold up their end of the deal for this to remain in effect. For details on this, and in proof text, we're not going to get to it um, and read it, but in Deuteronomy 28 is where it's all laid out. So if you want to look up the conditional Mosaic Covenant, that's where you can look. But here's the agreement. The agreement goes as follows. God says, if you obey the law that I have given you, then you will be blessed. If you disobey the law that I have given you, then you will be punished. So it's, it's dependent upon man, right? If you want blessing, then you obey. If you want punishment, then you disobey. And, and this is like the, the roller coaster of Israel's existence, right? Like you have these highs where it's like, man, we're following God and there's blessing. And then it's like we turn our back on God and now we're in captivity and things are really horrible. And then someone comes and saves them and it's like, yes, we're good. We're following God. And now we're going to turn back to the Baals. And it's up and down and up and down. So fast forward to Jesus engaging the Pharisees in Mark chapter 2. Jesus' message was brand new to them, even though it really wasn't brand new to the, to the scriptures because there was allusion to the new covenant in the Old Testament. But he's bringing a new message, right? Um, for a, over a thousand, I think it was like 1,200 or so years-ish from when the, the covenant was given, um, this is what drove their religion, right? So over a thousand years Israel had lived by the covenant given to Moses and Israel at that time. That is the old covenant, right? You must remain obedient in order for you to receive my blessing. That's the agreement. And it's all based on these 613 commandments that they had to follow very, very closely. This included a sacrificial system that was in place. It required people to bring sacrifices to the priests of the temple throughout the year to atone for their sins. But then Jesus shows up, right? So you have this old agreement, and again, you got to understand why they're holding so tightly to it. This is what had driven their religion for over a thousand years. And now Jesus shows up, 
and this new covenant that he mentions. Now, he doesn't say new covenant here, um, but he's referring to it. So what is that all about? And this is where it really becomes application for us. What is the new covenant that Jesus is bringing about? I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 8, and we're going to read Hebrews chapter 8 this morning. So if you have your Bible or phone or whatever you're using, go to Hebrews chapter 8, and um, we're going to read this because this is a great explanation of... Um, of what the new covenant is. And there's actually a line in here, a verse in here that is, is really telling for us today. So, so we've looked at their context. Why was it such a big deal for the, for the Pharisees that Jesus was doing this? Now, what is, why is it such a big deal for us? Okay, so Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to just go ahead and read it. Okay, the whole thing. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant, uh, than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Um, This is, by the way, coming out of the Old Testament in Ezekiel, this quote. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. And here's the the important verse. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And I will, I will remember their sins no more. That is, that is so crucial for us. How is it possible that he will remember our sins no more? Because of Jesus, right? Like we see in Mark chapter 2 that Jesus is talking about this old and new, but then we know the end of the story and we know what happens. So Jesus, even in the upper room when he's serving communion, what he says in, in the book of Luke, he says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So this is the moment when Jesus goes to the cross, the new covenant of his, his blood. So let's just, let's just kind of um, simplify and summarize, all right? Old equals laws written on tablets and papyrus, a sacrificial system that provided temporary forgiveness, priests that had to serve as the intermediaries between God and man. That's the old. New, the law is written on our hearts. The sacrificial system is no longer needed because Jesus provided the final sacrifice in which God could look at us and see him and say, God could look at us, see Jesus and say, I will remember their sins no more. Jesus now seated at the right hand of God serving as our high priest interceding on our behalf. So old is man not man-made, it's God-made, but it's man, you know, uh, it's authority of man, it's, it's man-driven, it's man-enforced. New covenant is Jesus did it, and it's done, and it's final, and therefore we have him now seated as our high priest. We don't need an intermediary, we don't have to go to another human being to get to God. We have direct access, the curtain was torn in two, which is a symbol of us now having direct access to God the Father. So that's the new covenant. So you hear that, right? And, and it's like, yeah, Pharisees, but let's just talk about us. Like, don't, aren't you grateful? Like, think about if that old sacrificial system, that old, the, the old way of doing things was still in place. Like, think about that, right? Like, like constantly 
man, you know, I messed up or like my kids messed up. I got to go get another dove or I got to go get another whatever. And I got to go to the temple and I got to sacrifice again. And like your sins are forgiven. But when you mess up again, come back and see us. Right. And then like every year, bring your lamb and bring, you know, you got to make the, the sacrifice, the, the big sacrifice for the year. And, and it's just like all these things. Then there's 613 laws that you got to, you got to, you got to, you know, hold tightly to and then you have the the priest who you know I want to talk to God I got to go to the priest and he's got to go on my behalf and, and it's like man all of that stuff is done away with and aren't you grateful that now it's it's like done and finished and it's it's freedom and it's it's Christ and it's his blood and it's this new covenant this new agreement where God says I look at you and I see Jesus and you don't have to do anything you don't have to work for it you don't have to pay for it like you you can't do anything you are incapable of doing anything to earn what I have given you. Like you are not good enough. You, you could work your whole entire life and there is absolutely nothing you can do. But guess what? Jesus can and Jesus did. Therefore, the agreement is between me and Jesus because he took your sins on the cross and he died in your place. Titus 3, 4 through 6 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Do you see now how the old and the new cannot be compatible? You see how they can't go together. You can't combine them. It can't be Jesus and then continue to do these things. Jesus said, no, it's only me. It's only Jesus, right? There's no other way. There's, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes except through me. Like, that is it. No other way. But you also see why the religious leaders might have been driven to anger because of their confusion and because of the defiance that Jesus appeared to present. All right? So you have this tension that continues to build, Right? So here's the big idea again. All right, the big idea again is this, that Jesus came to usher in a new covenant by his blood. So now you can kind of see where we got that from. Came to usher in a new covenant. We don't have to work for it, and I'm so grateful for that. But when we, are, when we receive salvation, we are counted righteous because of the blood of Jesus and not because of anything else. So let's rest in that. Let's celebrate that and um, we're going to sing a song before communion. I think we're singing Turn Your Eyes. Is that what we're singing? Yeah. So just like last week, we're gonna, I'm going to encourage you guys in this moment to um, just in the, in the spirit of thankfulness, thanksgiving, gratitude, um, let's just spend the next few moments. And, and these words that we sing, you know, these songs that are, that are picked by the worship team are not just thrown in there like out of, you know, picking pick names out of a hat, but like they're intentional. And so when we, when we sing songs like this, especially out of the message, the, the goal is to just continue in worship, right? This is worship. Singing is worship. Communion is worship. And so we continue in worship as we, as we turn our eyes, as we turn our gaze to Jesus. So um, big idea. He came to usher in a new covenant by his blood. And so aren't we thankful that that is the covenant that, that we live under, that that is the agreement that God made with his son as he, as he took our sins to the cross? So we turn our eyes to him. So in the next few moments, let's just, let's just sit and rest in that. Let the spirit encourage you in that and just be thankful for that. And um, at any moment during this song that you feel like you've, you've kind of had that time just to kind of sit and, and reflect on what Jesus did, then grab the elements and then I'll come back up here after we sing and, um, and I'll lead us in communion. But let's go ahead and pray and then we'll sing together. God, thank you for, um, for your word and uh, for, uh, God, thank you that we know the end of the story. I mean, the, these Pharisees and religious leaders and the people there w would have been so confused at what Jesus was trying to, trying to teach them or what he was trying to explain to them, but we know. And so we can, we can, we can celebrate that. We can, we can praise you for that. And, and we can rest knowing, God, that no matter what we do, no matter how we mess up, no matter what we might struggle with, no matter what our failures might be, that you still look at us and see Jesus. And we don't have to come and make more sacrifices and we don't have to come and pay penance. Like, we don't have to do any of that. No matter what we do, you still look at us and you still see Jesus because he did it. The, the agreement that you made was, yes, Jesus, if you go and take the sins of the world to that cross and shed your blood, then I look at that as the agreement. It's enough. It's sufficient. So God, thank you for that truth and thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross and for the shedding of his blood so that we might be counted righteous. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.